Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A session. You ask the questions, we give you some answers to hopefully help you on your way with your tech problems. Uh, please do get involved in the comments underneath, give us some ideas for stuff, and more importantly, ask us some questions about the things you're struggling with or maybe some stuff you just want to know about. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and either myself or Anna or both of us will be coming back to you soon. So the first question, actually there's two here, both, well, one of them's from Andre Roses and the other's from Chris Rides MTB, and they're both directed actually at me and my latest bike, which is the Canyon Lux Trail. I posted a few pictures online, and obviously I've done a little bit of information about them in, uh, them, about the bike on a previous GMBN Tech show, so you can go back and check that out. But I'm just gonna dive into this. So the first one was from Chris Rides MTB, it says, how would you describe the difference to the old Lux? And Andre says, what's the main difference between the Lux and the Neuron in terms of handling and trail use? I know there's a 10 mil travel difference. Okay, so firstly, let's deal with the Neuron actually. So the Neuron is an out and out trail bike. Uh, it's a more comfortable bike to ride. It's got a pivot on the rear end there. So the, the Lux and the Lux Trail are lacking a pivot in the rear end. So it's a single pivot and it uses a flex of the seat stay junction with the chain stay there uh, to actually enable the suspension to work. Now it's a really smart way of making a very lightweight bike, but it's just not comparable in terms of how well a bike with actual physical pivots can work. So the Neuron is a plusher bike, the suspension is gonna feel more planted, it's gonna be more comfortable, and arguably you're gonna have more control. It's obviously gonna be heavier as a result of that, but also the geometry as well, so, and the overall feel of the bike. So if you ignore the travel for a second, the Neuron you could say sits somewhere in the middle of a Lux and a Lux Trail in terms of the geometry. So it hasn't got the modern, longer geometry approach. It's nearer in terms of uh, geometry to the Lux, actually, but probably in terms of its ability in terms of the Lux Trail. Uh, so somewhere, somewhere in the middle there, I would say. Uh, now, just the two models, right? So in the regular Lux, you've got the CF and the CFR. So the CFR is the racing model, They're both carbon fiber. Um, it's just a little bit lighter, essentially, so team racer spec. Now there's also models with a 10 mil raise in fork travel. So typically the Lux has 100 mil travel, whereas the Lux Trail has 110. Um, on the Lux, you typically have a 100 mil travel fork, but you can get it with a 110 fork. Lux Trail is exclusively 110 rear and 120 front. So that is the setup on there. Now geometry on there, I'll talk about my bike because you've asked me about it here. So I'm gonna talk about size extra large. My previous Lux, Lunch. My previous Lux was an extra large. Head angle 69 and a half degrees. Seat angle 74 and a half degrees. Uh, Chainstay 435. Wheelbase 1183. Top tube was 651. I say was. It's hanging up there in the corner, ready to go back. Uh, and the reach 470. As you know, 470 is fairly short for uh, reach on a trail bike as such, but on a cross-country race bike, that's between 470 and 480 is probably about average on a size XL. Now with the Lux Trail, a little bit different. So the head angle, 67 and a half, so it's two degrees slacker. So although 67 and a half degrees isn't a slack head angle for a cross-country bike, this is still a cross-country bike, just it will handle more aggressive terrain that's a lot slacker. And it does feel like that when you're out on the trail. Uh, you've got to really coax it into the turns a bit more. You've really got to uh, basically push the bike a bit harder to make it feel more responsive. But the reward for that is when you put it into more nervous and sort of demanding situations, it feels a lot more confidence inspiring. So yeah, if I was a cross country race pro, I'd probably have a Lux Trail and a Lux set up with almost identical componentry and stuff to set up for the same size. But you've got a bike that will handle two different race courses very differently. Uh, seat angle's the same, 74 and a half degrees. Chainstay the same, uh, 435 mil, because the back end is identical on the two bikes. Uh, wheelbase, 1227 millimeters, so it's quite a lot longer. Uh, the same size, remember, extra large in both. Top tube, 674 mil, so over the 651, so another 20 mil or so longer on there. But the reach, about 30 mil longer, so the reach is 500 mil. So actually the difference between the bottom bracket axle and the handlebars is quite a lot longer. Now one of the things I changed on mine was actually to change the stem down from a 60 mil down to a 40 mil to actually get the top tube, um, sorry, to get the handlebar position to the bottom bracket the same as it was effectively on my other Canyon on the regular Lux, which had an 80 mil stem on there. Now you might note that the top tube on the bikes if you just take into fact that the Deluxe, basically the extra large, comes with an 80 mil stem and the Lux Trail comes with a 60 mil stem, they've kind of reduced it by the amount it needs to be. But 
I don't think they've thought about the actual reach and how that comes into equation. I found it had too much weight on the front end. So bringing the stem back a bit, sort of returned that, and the bike feels incredible now. So how do they feel different? So obviously the rear end travel is slightly different. It's only 10 mil more. The shock is the same length eye to eye. It just has five millimeter more stroke on there. So on the Lux, you have a 50 mil stroke, so that's a two to one. So 50 mil with 100 mil rear wheel travel. And on the Lux Trail, you've got 55, which equates to 110 mil. Now I've got to say the rear end, now that I've had my sorted out a bit, doesn't feel much different. You probably wouldn't notice the extra 10 mil, but it's certainly gonna help when you ride into slightly rougher stuff. The front end, however, feels completely different. It's a completely different bike. So it feels way stiffer. So the front triangle feels stiffer, but combined with the fact you've got a shorter stem, so you've got even less flex there, this thing is like precision. You guide this thing into stuff, and actually that's probably why the rear end feels like it's got less travel than it has, uh, because you're riding it so hard, the rear end's probably not doing the job that you thought it might do with the extra 10 mil travel. It sort of makes it feel like 100 mil rear travel. It's no bad thing though. I've seen some reviewers out there comment on that, but actually it's still just a cross country bike. Don't get carried away with the whole down country thing. I know they're marketing it as a fact it's a down country bike, but what is down country? It's just cross country. You can, it's just slightly more aggressive. It's not trail territory, even though the bike confusingly is called a Lux Trail. Um, I think they should just call it a Lux DC and be done with it. But anyway, I think it's a very good bike. And uh, now it's obviously a totally different bike. If I was a cross country racer and I was shorter, I'd probably stick on the Lux. Go for the slightly lighter, slightly more nimble, agile Lux, uh, very fit for purpose. If you're a taller rider, you're definitely gonna get more out of the Lux Trail just because of the fact the bike will fit you that bit better. Uh, of course, the preference is down to you, but you do have the ability of sizing down. Now it's that long, I could technically ride uh, the same length stem as I did on previous Lux, but have a slightly longer front end of the bike still. So uh, there's different options there. Like I said, it's still a cross country bike. You can push it a little bit harder, which accordingly you're gonna need slightly tougher tires. You're gonna need to run things slightly differently because of that effect. So at the moment I've got those down country Victoria tires on there and they're great. But if I'm completely honest, I actually prefer the ride of the cross country tires. Now the down country tires run 60 TPI, cross country tires run 120 TPI. So 120 TPI tire, naturally the carcass is more supple. It's gonna be more comfortable, simple as that. The 60 TPI tire, you can make it feel more comfortable, but you've got to run it at a much lower tire pressure. Now this is amazing because you can handle it because the sidewalls are so much thicker on those tires and it's the full intention of it. I just think I'm at the upper end of the weight limit to be able to do that on that tire. And for the way that I like to ride, I mean, in the middle of winter when I'm running the tires about 20 PSI, it's fine because you're, you're basically, you're a passenger riding through the mud and stuff, you're sliding around. But as soon as I want to push into stuff, I'm just that little bit too heavy to be able to do it. So I tend up running the tire at slightly higher pressure and I'm not making the most of it and the casing feels a bit firm for that. So I'm probably, as far as cross country stuff goes, gonna to return to the 120 TPIs, but I will definitely be using the 60s in the summer because those things are really, really good. Um, hopefully you got some answers out of that. Uh, next is from Lars Thordeson. Doddy, I'm curious about sprung versus unsprung mass. Is there a point where the weight of the bike starts to make the weight of the wheels irrelevant? I'm thinking about Commissar and their recent success in the downhill scene. Their bikes are aluminium and I'd imagine makes them heavier and able to push the wheels easier. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, it kind of does, I'm not sure what the exact point is, but let me just use some examples here. So at the extreme end, you've got an e-bike. So if we look at e-bikes, for example, on the heavier end of things, you've got a frame that weighs loads. So your sprung mass weighs an absolute ton. You've got a big battery in there, you've got the motor. And because it's so heavy, it makes the unsprung mass, regardless of how heavy the wheels are, feel really light. So your suspension is working overtime. Even with cheap dampers, front and rear, an e-bike suspension will feel absolutely amazing. And I would say, just on feel alone, will feel better than any regular mountain bike. We're not talking about a crazy high-end bike that's been well-tuned and stuff, just like for like. So, but it's also why, if you look at cross-country bikes, the complete opposite end, 100 mil travel, super light bikes, even if you set the suspension up really soft on them, they feel really skittish. It's because the thing is so light, your sprung mass is so light that the, the unsprung mass can't really work very well against it. So you could say a cross-country bike with two water bottles full on there will perform a lot better because you've added to that sprung mass. Now, you're, what you're saying here is um, at what point, or what you're asking, is there a point where the weight of the bike starts to make the weight of the wheels relevant? I don't actually know what that weight is and I would love to actually do some experiments to find out. And in fact, I'm gonna do that. But it does remind me of a brand that did do that very experiment and I need to get in touch with them. So Nikolai Bikes, 
In fact, this would have been Chris Porter and the Mojo Rising crew. They experimented for a few years with lead weights on the down tube of some of their bikes. I think it might have been on one of the downhill race team. I forget the, the racer. But by putting small amounts of lead on there, putting it by strip, they could fine tune the amount of weight on that and fine tune what was happening with the suspension at either end of the bike. Absolutely fascinating, although clearly not very good for a bike because you're putting an additional weight on a tube that's not designed for it. So you're probably gonna end up cracking your bike if you do that. But the whole point was they were adding to the sprung mass in order to try and make the unsprung mass feel lighter as such. Now, when we come to downhill bikes, they've obviously got fairly heavy frames, they've got big coil shocks on them, massive springs. And even though they've got burly wheels, the actual wheels themselves probably aren't that much different to in enduro race wheels. Uh, the tires may be a little bit heavier, sure, but relatively speaking, the wheels are gonna feel lighter front and back compared to the frame than they would on, say, an enduro race bike. So yeah, a downhill bike is always gonna feel really, really good, but I will try and work out what the actual weight is when it starts to make a difference. I think that's really interesting, and it's a good idea for a video there, uh, but you could probably do your own experiments by adding water bottles onto your bike. Uh, in it, like a basic case, if you've got a super light bike, water bottles are definitely gonna make a bit of a difference on there to how it feels. Uh, interesting, food for thought. Has anyone else experimented with adding weight onto the front triangle of their bikes and have they noticed the weight difference uh, in terms of how the bike and the suspension works? I think it's interesting stuff to talk about. Okay, next one, Daniel Olave. Uh, hi, Doddy and Anna, loving the channel and the show. Thank you very much, and I'm sure Anna will say the same. Uh, question is, I've got a 2020 Scott Genius 950. It's got a Fox Float 34, 150mm travel twin lock. My first full suspension bike, I'm loving it. Tell you what, you've landed on your feet there. That is a great bike, really good bike. I'm swapping 29 and 27 and a half plus wheels around, and I'm planning to do some enduro races. Uh, 1.73 centimeters high and 95 kilos. I'm a bit worried about the thin 34 mil upper legs for rough trails and jumps. I'm planning on getting a Fox 36 with 160 mil travel. Would that mess up the geometry? What if I set the flip chip to the high position? Would that help maintain it? Okay, well firstly, the 34 to a 36 is a good and a sensible approach, although I've got to stand up for the 34 though. It's not as bad as people might think. I'm weighing 95 kilos, I've got one on my, on my reactor. It's only 130 mil travel with the setting I have it on, and yes, it is noticeably more flexible than the 36, but it's a surprisingly brutal fork. can do a lot. I mean, they offer the 34 in the e-bike spec, so uh, think about that before you spend your money. But that said, Jumping onto a 36, you will get a lot more confidence from it, and it's a very, very good fork. You certainly wouldn't be disappointed going for it, so, uh, so don't let me put you off. I'm just throwing out some suggestions there, but 36, excellent fork. Now, jumping up 10 mil in travel, depending on the particular bike it goes on, and a particular fork, uh, typically, if you're adding 10 mil to the front end of a bike, uh, you're gonna lose about a degree off the head angle, which is kind of a good thing, but it doesn't always work quite like that, because some forks, you might jump up 10 mil in travel, but the actual axle to crown won't change that much. You might only get like a five mil difference, and then if you add into the equation that arguably by having a fraction more travel, you're gonna have a fraction more sag. Uh, relatively speaking. If you're having 25% sag, it'll be a tiny bit more sag. So uh, it won't be that noticeable. Now, yes, you could adjust some of that with a flip chip and raise your bottom bracket to compensate, uh, but bear in mind you're raising your bottom bracket. So the lower the bottom bracket is, the more stable your bike's gonna feel. Higher bottom bracket, uh, the better clearance you're gonna have. So there's a fine line between them, and it is something that people rarely change uh, once they find a setting that works, but it's a worthwhile thing. If you're doing enduro races, you might find on certain courses you need that extra bottom bracket height so you can pedal through some sections that are particularly rocky or rooty. Uh, good example there. I wouldn't necessarily think it's something you're gonna to need to mess with. I'd keep it there as a reserve to tune with your geometry, but only you will know. So it will slacken off your seat angle very slightly, so you might need to bring the saddle, I don't know, five mil further forwards on the rails just to return that position, but I think it'd be a good upgrade on that bike, and it's up to you if you wanted to have the twin lock version on there or not. Um, probably not if you're gonna run with the Fox 36, you wanna get, uh, in an ideal world, get a grip two damper. That thing is unbelievably good once it's set up. It does take quite a while with a four-way, uh, with a two-way compression, two-way rebound damping to get it good, uh, but it's really, really good. Uh, so don't be put off, but like I said, the 34 is a great fork, uh, so I wouldn't worry about it, but you will get more performance from the 36. Uh, next up from Justin uh, Kiancoen. Uh, I've got a 150 mil travel front and rear all mountain bike. When I go from single track to more of a downhill bike park, should I increase the air pressure in my suspension? Uh, mind you, I'm still new to bike parks, so I won't be getting the wheels high off the ground. Small tables and drops for now. Okay, so if you've got your bike well set up in the first place, um, don't change anything. 
You need to write it to see how your setup is doing. Now, something you might wanna do is make notes of your air pressure and your fork and your shock uh, and the damping settings. Now, always make those damping settings from fully closed. So for example, if your fork has 12 clicks of compression, turn it fully clockwise, and then the amount of compression you have is how many unwind it. So if it's four turns backwards for now, it's four clicks, for example. If you note those settings down, you'll always be able to return it to where you started if you make adjustments and you don't like it. So just a useful thing to do. And now some pro racers and mechanics actually note that on the fork, sometimes like in Tipex or marker pen, uh, just for their immediate reference to stuff once they've got a good base setting. Now, some adjustments you might want to make though, if the bike park's particularly steep and it's different from your regular single track that you're riding, you might want the front end to feel like it's up a little bit more rather than diving down, which can make you feel perched over the front end. You can achieve this in a couple of different ways. One might be to run just a little less sag, so firm up the fork a tiny bit, but you've got to be careful because you still want your fork to be nice and active. But if you're riding steeper terrain, you're going to have more body weight on there anyway, so you're going to get the full use of it. It will just keep it up a bit. Um, I'm only talking about marginal amount, so if you normally have 30% sag, maybe try 25% sag. So not a massive difference, but it will make a difference on the trail. The other option is to run more low speed compression. Now that is the more favorable option that I would suggest. Low speed compression is a very much underused damping setting. And many people are guilty of just unwinding it because they want their fork to feel like as active as possible. But you put low speed compression on and it's gonna resist the fork, uh, at least partially resist it to diving under body weight loading. So it's a really good feature. I think people don't make the most of, so definitely experiment with that. The other thing you might want to take advantage of is the rebound on your rear shock. So that horrible feeling that you can get when you hit a jump and it sends you, you know, get kicked up the bum a bit and you feel like you can go over the bars. Never a nice feeling, and don't get me wrong, a bike setup is not going to dramatically change something if you were doing something wrong in the riding sense. However, if there's problems from the bike that have led to it, and there's two things that can happen here. So one is your shock was too fast at extending, so you literally buck like a pogo stick in which case adding some rebound damping will slow the, the rebound or the return stroke of the shock down, uh, which can control that. But the thing we tend to see more on people's bikes isn't the fact that the shock was running too fast, it's more that they're running too much sag. So if you load your bike into the lip of a takeoff and you're using all of that travel, all of that stored energy has got to come back out again and the rebound has to do a much harder job, so people to put on too much rebound. So actually, checking the rear spring rate is actually as important as checking the damping. And I would suggest if you're running 30% um, sag in general on the rear end of a bike and you're going to a bike park that's got jumps, going a little bit firmer and, and also adding on a couple of clicks of rebound is a good thing. Now, if your bike can sit higher in those compressions, the shock shaft speed is gonna be slower when it returns. Yeah, so it's not gonna give you that bucking feeling. Uh, good luck and enjoy it as well. Um, next up from Bernard Atkins. I'm a conf I'm a conf I'm confused about sorry about it. I'm confused about bar width and setup. For years I used to run fairly narrow bars and after the last decade or so I've been getting wider and wider which feels good to me. My friends are all into racing tell me top and races are going the other way. What's better and why are they going narrow? Good question actually. So um, well firstly let's just talk about bike fit. So there's a few things with your handlebars and stem that will change everything. So if your stem is long, it's gonna load your front end of the bike, put you in a stretched out position. If your stem is short, it's gonna do the opposite. It's gonna bring you back. Likewise, with your handlebars, if they're short, it's gonna bring you upright. If they're wide, they're gonna bring you down over the front. So if you have a short stem, naturally, the tendency is to have a wide bar, so it returns your position. So you're not just bringing yourself backwards, you're bringing yourself backwards and then down again. So you're getting a nice quick steering with a short stem, but a stability of the wide bar. Uh, so just think about that before you go changing anything on the bike, and same for anyone. Now, on paper, a nice long bike with slack geometry and wide bars is the most stable thing through rough terrain, through fast terrain, and through steep terrain. And largely, that's what they're doing in Enduro World Series stages. Uh, some of those races can, like stages, can be like 20 minutes, really rough, long descents. Now, what we're seeing now is some of the racers are trying to pick closer and closer lines to get to trees and stuff that are actually starting to size down on the handlebars. Now, Richie Rude, big dude, really big dude. He's running 760s on his bike. Uh, at least the last bike I saw was running 760s on there. And you would think, why are you not running 780s or even 800? But it's the same thing. He's strong enough and he's a good enough rider that he's trying to remove any errors possible that he might make just with that sort of cat whisker thing going close to trees and that. Just gives him a little bit more room for like error, I guess, when you're absolutely on the edge trying to find those knife edge lines. Now, another example is bike sizing, full stop. 
Jack Moyer, he's six, I'm going to say six one. Uh, I think he's probably taller than six one, he's a tall dude. But on paper, he's a size XL on bikes. He famously rides a size large. He wants the bike and needs the bike to be more reactive to stuff. Now sizing down and running narrow bars, your bike is going to sort of run away from you if you're not able to control it. So a wider bar and a bike that fits you correctly in terms of length is always going to offer you the optimum. But it's not to suggest that's the way that you have to go. So the reason riders are coming down in bar size is to basically make the bikes more maneuverable through the tighter twisted wooded sections really. Uh, and as we're seeing, like I said on EWS, we're seeing bikes come shorter in terms of bikes as well, which goes against the grain of what all the marketing out there is telling you with longer, lower slacker. Uh, so I think it's quite cool. You've got to bear in mind though, that anyone racing an EWS race, they're like in the absolute upper abilities of mountain bike racing. Uh, even to qualify for those races and to be riding at that level on that sort of terrain, you are a seriously accomplished rider. So just don't forget that, that there's no substitute for being an amazing rider. You know, you think like Steve Pete used to win on some awful bikes back in the day and some tiny little bikes. Um, you know, it's all about the rider, not the bike. But of course, you can experiment with that stuff too. But if you're happy with wide bars, stick with wide bars. Uh, next up from LAG. I was looking to upgrade to a tubeless wheel set but my bike comes with 2.1 stock tires. Will a 2.20 fit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unless your bike has particularly narrow rims, in theory, if it's got 2.1s on there, you could go up to a, I'd say 2.4, maybe 2.5 at a push. Uh, you wouldn't want your rims to be any narrower than 25 mil, I would say. That would be your absolute cutoff point. Generally, the wider the rims are, obviously the bigger the tire can be. Uh, but yeah, you should be fine with that, going up to 2.2. No problems at all. Uh, Gareth Welby. Why don't we see coil sharks on cross-country bikes? Yeah, kind of a good, valid point, actually. They track the ground better. I, I guess you could say they're less adjustable. You could say they're heavier. Um, I know you can get titanium springs and super light steel springs and things like that, but they're still not going to be as light as you know the classic uh, bare minimum air can shock. And I've got to say, they're probably a bit pointless. Cross-country bikes, you've got such a light bike, the, the sprung mass and the unsprung mass are so light that a coil shock, the improvement that you're gonna get in consistency is gonna be negligible. Uh, you may as well go for the lightest possible shock. And let's face it, the lightest possible shocks now with the size of the negative air spring on them works brilliantly on a cross-country bike. That said, I would be interested in trying a coil shock on a cross-country bike just to see. Interesting stuff. Anyone else out there running a coil shock on a 100 mil travel bike? If you are, uh, let us know. Um, not including retro, because obviously we've moved on since those days. Uh, there we go, that's it for this week. Uh, get your questions in down there. Uh, as always, keep it positive, and we'll see you in the next show. Ta-ra.